Imagine living in a room with no windows, no sunlight, no fresh air, no way to tell if it's morning or midnight. At first, you think you'll adapt. You breathe the stale air. You keep working. You keep going. You tell yourself, it's fine. But after a while, something strange happens. You stop noticing time pass. You forget how it felt to feel motivated. You don't crash. You just fade. And that's what burnout is. After my IGCSE exams, I thought the hardest part was over. But I didn't realize how deeply burned out I was. Mentally, emotionally, physically. Then almost immediately, I moved countries. From Ghana to India. From familiar faces and rhythms to a place where everything felt loud, fast, and extremely unfamiliar. I was 16. And suddenly, everything I knew was different. Something was off. <laughs> Every task that I tried to do started to feel heavy. I would stare at my books for hours without absorbing any information. I wasn't tired. I just wasn't feeling anything. And that's when I realized. I wasn't just tired or sad. I was burned out. And the scariest part, I didn't even remember what being normal used to feel like. This is what stress does to your brain. And what's wild is, this isn't just a feeling. The part of your brain that helps you learn and remember the hippocampus, it actually shrinks. The part that helps you make decisions and focus the prefrontal cortex. It short circuits under pressure. And the one system that makes life feel rewarding and meaningful, the dopamine system, it just goes quiet. Now, let's go deep into the brain and trace exactly what's happening. The hippocampus is the brain's main memory hub, involved in storing, forming, and retrieving decorative memories. But under chronic stress, especially prolonged exposure to cortisol, the body's stress hormone, this region shrinks. A study was conducted by Lupin et al., which showed that high cortisol levels in older adults correlated with a 14% smaller hippocampal volume and poorer memory performance. Let's understand what this means by looking at the graph behind me. May look small, it tells a very big story. What you're looking at here is the relationship between cortisol, the body's main stress hormone, and the hippocampus. Each dot here represents a real person. So scientists measured how their cortisol levels changed and compared it to the actual volume of the hippocampus. And the trend is crystal clear. The higher the cortisol at the time, the smaller the memory center becomes. And this is why during chronic stress or burnout, you can forget passwords, birthdays, or even conversations you had the day before. You're not forgetful. Your brain is quite literally losing its grip on memory formation. Now, I talked about stress. But let's talk about two key areas which are deeply involved when you experience stress. The prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. The prefrontal cortex, located just behind your forehead, handles the high-level thinking. I mean things like decision-making, focus, and self-control. So it's what helps you prioritize your to-do list, stay calm under pressure, and just regulate your emotions. The amygdala, on the other hand, is located deeper in the brain and helps you process emotions, especially the fight or flight response. So, in a well-balanced brain, the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala
balance each other out. But under chronic stress, this balance shifts. The prefrontal cortex now loses efficiency and the amygdala becomes more reactive, more easily triggered. And under prolonged pressure, people often describe themselves as indecisive, forgetful, or as we all know, just not thinking straight. Now let's look at the two pictures of the brain right here. Now, the picture on the left is your brain during normal conditions. You'll see a lot of blue and green regions. This is the prefrontal cortex, which has multiple subregions. But the important thing here is this part of the brain is in charge. But look at the image on the right. This is your brain during stress, chronic stress, burnout. Do you notice what's changed? The prefrontal cortex has basically gone offline and the amygdala has taken over. So, your brain struggles to stay organized and focused. This is why things feel wrong, even when nothing's technically wrong. Now, I've talked about what happens to the brain during stress. But what happens to you, the person? You laugh, but it doesn't feel like yours. You talk, but your words feel automatic. You look in the mirror and think, who is this tired version of me? I used to be different. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is not poetic exaggeration. This is neurological reality. Chronic stress interferes with the part of our brain that helps you reflect, remember our past, and understand ourselves. But when that's disrupted, people begin to experience a fractured sense of identity. Yes, you heard me right. A fractured sense of identity. So, I want you all to do something very simple. In your head, close your eyes if you're comfortable. I want you to think of a moment where you felt most yourself. Alive, clear, confident, curious, that version of yourself. Now, I want you to think of a version of yourself, maybe even a recent one, where you felt most unlike yourself. Foggy, tired, numb, maybe even irritable in a way you didn't like. Now, ask yourself, what changed? And sometimes the only thing that changed was stress, was fatigue. So we've talked about memory, planning, identity, but we need to go deeper. Not what you can't do during burnout, but what you can't feel. Joy, creativity, excitement, and dopamine. Every time you finish a task, eat a snack, or get a compliment, your brain releases a little burst of dopamine. But here's the problem. When that system is overstimulated, it crashes. Think of dopamine like a light switch. You flick it a few times, it works. But if you keep flicking it a thousand times a day, scroll, scroll, like, snack, notification, another task, the bulb burns out. Not permanently, but it dims. And that's what dopamine fatigue is. So, it's not a lack of discipline. It's literal neurochemical fatigue. Your brain is trying to conserve energy by muting the system. Now, it's understood the brain is vulnerable. But, it is also adaptable. And that ability to adapt Neuroplasticity is what this next chapter is about. Now, neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to change in neural function and structure in response to changes in behavior, environment, and even thought. Correct? So, what happens is, when, even in the wake of burnout, 
your brain can choose to rebuild itself. And it's not a grand cinematic thing that you have to do. So, allow me to share things that help me reclaim parts of my brain I thought I had lost and the science that backs them up. So the first and foremost one, the one that I'm sure everybody at some point in their life have overlooked. <coughs> sleep. Sleep, especially slow wave sleep, helps in emotional regulation and cortical control. So disrupting our sleep cycle essentially elevates cortisol and impairs our memory center. Now, once more, you see the pictures of the two brains behind you. The one on the left, the person has had good sleep. That means the emotional part of the brain is connected to the thinking part. That means you can respond wisely and think more clearly. But look at the other brain. This person was sleep deprived. So that connection is broken. What this means is you feel more reactive, more easily triggered by things that normally wouldn't have really affected you. Moving on to my second one. Engaging in non-outcome based creativity, such as doodling, music, or even just open-ended play in general. And this helps a part of our brain to process and integrate emotions better. So it replenishes dopamine by creating low pressure novel stimulations. Right? So this is a quote that I really I do try to aspire to live up to every day. It may not be every day, but I try. And that is what matters. Art is the highest form of hope. Moving to my third one, something that I know a lot of people find corny and cheesy, something that my fellow speaker had also mentioned, journaling. Journaling helps improve the left prefrontal cortex. So, it means it helps you in self-coherence, understanding yourself. A study was conducted by UCLA which showed that participants who journaled about distress showed improvement in cognitive control. So, labeling emotions help reduce the activity of the very reactive part, the amygdala, of the brain. So, journey, as I mentioned. Now, moving to something new once again. Seeking novelty. What is that mean? trying new or unexpected thing, as I said, boosts our brain's motivation system. So, for me, I started googling weird things again. What does space smell like? Why do cats purr? It wasn't for school. It wasn't for performance. It reminded my brain that I'm allowed to want to know things just because. And moving to my fifth and final one, habits. Habits create what's called predictable dopamine cues. So essentially, they reduce the fatigue that goes into making decisions. And in turn, this creates positive loops, expectation loops, that makes your brain feel it is at rest. Mine was tying my shoelaces slowly. Sounds silly, I know. But in that moment, I wasn't rushing. I was arriving. So, remember how we talked about that room with no windows, no sunlight, no fresh air? Just a ticking clock that you couldn't hear anymore. That room wasn't a metaphor for despair. It was a mirror of what happens when your brain under stress starts to shut out the world and 
eventually starts to shut out yourself. Because the title of my talk wasn't just a metaphor. This is how the brain breaks down and builds you in you. Not in grand cinematic moments, in small quiet acts of care, in sleeping in time, in replacing pressure with presence. The day you start showing up for your brain, your brain begins to show up for yourself. Thank you for listening, thank you for staying, and maybe, just maybe, what the fact is.